It's a pleasure to worship with you all tonight. I want to thank our moderator for being involved with this as well. And I want to thank Dr. Hunter, uh, who I have a deep respect for, and, and I count him as a friend. Uh, let me ask you to listen very closely. I'm going to read to you a statement. It's not, it's not my statement. I'm going to read to you this statement, and I want to, you to think if you can agree with this statement. I believe in the sovereignty of God. If a man doesn't believe in the sovereignty of God, he's a sheer fool. I believe not a blade of grass moves without God's permission. I believe he knows the name of every star. He puts them all there. He is almighty. I believe that. I believe in foreordination. I believe in predestination. I believe in calling. I believe in election. I believe in all of that. Why do I believe that? Because I can read the Bible. Anybody who can read the Bible has to believe in all that because it's all there. Black print on white paper. Now who can say, you don't have to raise your hand, but who can say, I believe all that? Well, you know who believed all that? Adrian Rogers. How do I know Adrian Rogers believed all that? Because Adrian Rogers said that. I'm giving you a quote from Adrian Rogers. And I say that to say, I don't think a lot of these differences sets us far apart as we might think they do sometimes when we get into the rhetoric or the heavy debate of Calvinism or non-Calvinism. And my goal tonight is not really to convince anyone of a certain systematic theology. And even though my theology, you could say, is reformed, I don't even prefer to be called a Calvinist. And probably most people in my church that I've pastored for seven years first heard that I was a Calvinist when I said I was going to be doing this debate. I'm much more interested in looking at Scripture and discussing what it says about God and how He saves us and the glorious story how He saves His people. Here's another quote from Adrian Rogers that I think sums up what I believe. I'm not interested really in a name given to a theology or being called a Calvinist or a Baptist or whatever. I am committed to what the Bible teaches. You know, if we have any Baptist doctrine, we need to get rid of it. If we have any Presbyterian doctrine or Methodist doctrine, we need to get rid of it. We need to see what the Bible teaches and just zero in on the Word of God. And to that I say amen. So my goal today is not to make any of you Calvinists. Most of you are saying, good, because you weren't going to. <laughs> my goal today is not to narrow down the definition of Baptist, of Baptist doctrine. My goal today is twofold. Number one, I hope that by the end of the debate, no one will fear that the doctrines labeled as Calvinism will hurt the Southern Baptist Convention. That's my first goal. Number two, that you will all see that Reformed theology has at its center a biblical and beautiful story of God's grace for His glory. Those are my goals. But if I convince you of nothing else, I hope we can all link together and say our differences are okay. You see, I have no interest in being counted with those who want to rid the SBC of Calvinism, or on the other hand, to be counted with anyone who might want to rid the SBC of what has been called the traditional view. My belief as a Southern Baptist is that we are a big tent when it comes to peripheral issues, and I believe this is a peripheral issue. I just hope that by the end, that if anyone had the goal of ridding the SBC of Calvinism and Calvinists, that they can let that go. And say, you know what? We can work together. To assist me in convincing you that Calvinism isn't dangerous, I need to first clear, clear the air on some straw men about Calvinism and about my own personal views. Now, I believe Dr. Hunter knows these things about me, but I say them for your benefit. I believe in the Great Commission. I believe that every person on earth needs to hear the gospel. I believe that if someone is old enough to understand and never repents of their sin and never has faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus on the, their behalf, then they will spend a Christless eternity in hell. And I believe that all who truly repent of their sin and receive Christ as Lord and Savior are guaranteed a Christ-filled eternity. I believe while some have a special giftedness to be evangelists, that all Christians, and I say all Christians, are called to evangelize, which includes a verbal proclamation of the gospel. I believe, though God knows who are His, 
as the Scriptures say, that none of us have that knowledge. And therefore, every person needs to hear the Gospel. I believe in missions that spread from next door to the ends of the earth. As I've heard it said, Acts 1.8 is not a multiple choice. I believe in inviting people to be saved, which is most typically done by a heartfelt prayer of repenting and believing. I am a pastor, and I preach every Sunday in hopes of seeing people come to Christ. And because of that, and my belief in the power of God's Spirit and His Word, every Sunday morning, when I'm done preaching, I do an invitation, and I hope people come to know Jesus. That's who I am. I also believe that those who reject Calvinism typically do so out of a heartfelt concern that maybe Calvinism will hurt the spread of the Gospel. That maybe those who are Calvinists will not proclaim the Gospel as they should. But let me be clear. I believe that if someone is letting Calvinism be their excuse for not proclaiming the Gospel, that Calvinism isn't the problem. The problem most likely is that they are lazy or prideful or uncaring. And many Calvinists that maybe have written blogs or waxed poetic on a seminary campus are often simply those things. You see, Calvinism isn't the problem when a Calvinist doesn't share the Gospel. The heart is the problem. Sin is the problem. Just as it is for any of us who fear away from sharing Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, too many people have perverted a systematic theology to excuse a cold heart. But let's be honest. Many Calvinists today and in history have been great evangelists and great missionaries. Many who believe in the doctrines of grace have shared that grace with, with countless others. From the very first missionary to Native Americans, John Eliot, to the father of modern missions, William Carey, to the great evangelist George Whitfield, to the beloved Baptist missionary Adoniram Judson, to D. James Kennedy's personal evangelism training, and to John Piper's mission focus today, Calvinists often love reaching people for Jesus Christ. Sometimes they're our greatest leaders at it. One author put it this way, it could rightly be argued that Calvinism is not only not a barrier to missions and evangelism, but is actually proven to be a spur to missions and evangelism. In fact, it has often been the driving force in missions. Moreover, specifically for us as Southern Baptists, a 2008 LifeWay research project showed that baptisms in non-Calvinist and Calvinist SBC churches were virtually identical. The survey by LifeWay also showed that Calvinist seminary graduates were actually more likely to do personal evangelism than non-Calvinist ones were. So please, refuse the idea that Calvinism in itself hurts the Great Commission. Calvinism in the hands of cold hearts hurts the Great Commission. Just as much as Arminianism in the hands of cold hearts hurts the Great Commission. As I have mentioned, some feel Calvinism is an especially dangerous systematic theology because it may be a discouragement for sharing the gospel. And some worry it will hurt our denomination. But let's not kid ourselves. There is great danger in perversions of a more Arminian doctrine as well. In fact, Arminianism, if you mix it with the baptism, Baptist doctrine of eternal security, can be quite dangerous. You see, the danger of any Arminian theology is making salvation too man-centered. And when salvation is presented as man-centered, it can lead to manipulation and calling people to confess Christ. And here's the problem. If you are manipulative in the way that you call people to come to Christ, and then you tell them, by the way, now that you've walked an aisle, you're good to go, and you have nothing to worry about, and you can go live the way that you always lived, I can't think of a more dangerous doctrine to teach somebody. That they can come down, pray a prayer, and move on and be fine, and never have a changed life, and never have a life that shows that it's given, self, given themselves to Jesus, is dangerous. So dangerous that Jesus said, listen, 
I've come for those who recognize that they're sick. I don't come for those who think they have it all together. But yet we have a lot of churches, don't we, that have membership roles with people that never show up, who sit at home thinking that because 25 years ago they walked an aisle and the pastor said that I was okay, that I don't need Jesus anymore. Because I've checked that box. So our church is hurting from even a more Arminian doctrine that has ruled evangelicalism really for the last hundred years. Is a Calvinism that leads to weak evangelism dangerous? Of course. And true Calvinists should be passionate about evangelism. But Arminian theology, coupled with once saved, always saved, could be far more dangerous depending on how it's communicated to the person. So I hope by the end of tonight we can all agree that Calvinism is not some threat endangering the Southern Baptist Convention. When in reality, if we were to be honest, many of our churches in our denomination are already half dead and on life support from false conversions, from bad theology. And I hope that anyone running around like Chicken Little worried that Calvinism is going to cause the end to our denomination understands that our denomination has been in trouble for a lot longer than Calvinism has been popular. Our denomination doesn't need to get rid of Calvinism. It needs revival. It needs passionate people, no matter what their theology, passionate about proclaiming Jesus Christ, passionate about what we heard the sermon on tonight, about purity, about prayer, about receiving the power of God and then praising Him, which is so often seen in proclamation. So is Calvinism dangerous to the SBC? I say no, not a chance. Can people use Calvinism to be lazy about reaching people? Yes. And that is dangerous. And it should be addressed. And it should be addressed, I think, in seminary. Seminary should be very careful to teach those who come in with Calvinist doctrine to have a passion for the Great Commission that's greater than their passion for Calvinism. That happened to me. I became a Calvinist in college, and that's all I cared about. I was very zealous for Calvinism. And I went to what some have very ill feelings towards. I went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and they did not make me a Calvinist. They made me a Great Commission lover. And I had professor after professor after professor who said, listen, men, listen, women, if you've come in here as a Calvinist, fine. But you need to care more about reaching people for Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that. So what's the solution? I don't think it's dividing over the issue. I think it's focusing on the Great Commission. I think that's the solution. And it would be great if we could just say, hooray, we're done. You know, Dr. Hunter and I agree. We should just focus on reaching people for Jesus Christ. But this is a debate. So I need to talk about where we disagree. So let me hit that in my last few minutes here, all right? While I've already explained that Calvinism is not a danger to the SBC, I now want to explain that it is both biblical and a beautiful doctrine, the testimony of God's love for His people. The doctrines of grace show the beautiful story of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. I, I once heard a debate that Dr. Hunter had with, a, with another Calvinist, um, and that Calvinist said that he actually is Calvinist because it's harsh and ugly. And I thought, oh, I wish you wouldn't have said that. That's not why I believe in the doctrines of grace. I believe it's a beautiful telling of God's grace and glory. What's so beautiful about the doctrines of grace? It tries to summarize the beauty that is the great love story that God has for His people. All of Scripture, all of it, points to a God who created a people for Himself, who chose those people, who loved those people to make them His own. And He did it not because of their great works, but because of His great love. It was all of grace. It was nothing that was earned. He chose Himself a people, and the passage of time is a revelation of those who those people are. And with each person that gives their life to Jesus, we see another one of God's sheep coming home to the fold. Let me give you scriptural back background for this. We know that God has a book of life filled with the names of His people. And those names have been in that book since before the foundation of the world. You say, what? 
names have been in the book of life before the foundation of the world. It says that twice in Revelation 13.8 and 17.8. So the love story that God has for His people began before the foundations of the world. Ephesians talks about this in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for His adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. Before creation, God knew you by name. He loved you. He cared for you. And now He has saved us for His glory. God did this for His people, like He did for Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah 1.5 I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. David said of himself, but we accept it as a verse for all of us. Psalm 139.16 Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. God chose John the Baptist before his birth to make a way for the Lord, according to Luke chapter 1. He also did it for the Apostle Paul, who in Galatians 1, 15, 16 said, but when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me. Now when we look at all these great saints, do we count these examples as unfair? Do we say it's not fair that God did this for them? No, we say praise God that He did that for Jeremiah. Praise God that He did that for David. Praise God that He did that for John the Baptist. Praise God that He did that for the Apostle Paul. And praise God that He did it for me. And praise God that He did it for you. He chose you before you were even formed in your mother's womb to save you, to call you for His great purpose. Moreover, we look at the Old Testament as a great testimony to the fact that God chose a people. Why did He choose Israel? Because He foresaw their faith? No. Because He knew they would choose Him? No. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8, the Lord was devoted to you and chose you not because you were more numerous than all the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you. And He kept the oath He swore to your fathers. God simply chose to love a people. Not based on their goodness, but on His choice. And we realize from Galatians and elsewhere that the fulfillment of this covenant of grace made to Abraham and to his descendants is not just made for Jews, but for all those who have faith in Jesus Christ. God chose to make himself known to a people who would then show they are his by their response in repentance and faith. Those who did not respond in faith and repentance were not his people. 1 Peter 2, 8-10. Some stumbled. They stumbled by disobeying the message. They were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the One who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Those in Christ or those who believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, thereby showing or revealing that they are His people, but the reason they believed is because God opened their eyes. Because He chose a people for Himself. He drew them to Himself. It tells us as much as 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Beautiful verse. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Our hearts were dark. And God turned on the light and said, there is Jesus Jesus also made this clear all throughout the Gospel of John. John 15, 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed that you should go out and produce fruit, fruit that will remain. In John 10, 14 and 15, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. As the Father knows me, I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. John 6, 63 through 65. The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. John 6, 37 and 44. Everyone the Father gives to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will never cast out. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. This is glorious. This is graciousness. God chose for Himself a people to redeem with His own blood. Other passages that I don't have time to share with you. Titus 2.14. Acts 13.48. i got to share that one. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and glorified the message of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. God has for Himself a people who He's revealed Himself, who He's called to, who He's loved. 
And the great beauty of the Gospel is that we can praise God for that. And then we can fulfill the purpose to proclaim God to the nations. Dr. Hunter? <clears throat> All right. Well, I first want to say what a privilege it is to be taking part in tonight's debate. I would also like to express my appreciation to the Whosoever Will Conference, to this great church, and to your fine pastor, and to Pastor Cooper for being willing to take part in this important in-house debate. I say in-house debate because I'm proud to consider Pastor Cooper a brother in Christ. While we disagree on a very important matter, we agree on a great many more things. And he's also a friend of mine. We've worked together in evangelistic events. This is a man who does have altar calls in his church and does lead people in the sinner's prayer, at least I did when I was there. So um, I, I'm happy to consider him a brother in Christ. He's also a brilliant theological mind and a wonderful friend. I, I think that's all going to make for an exciting, engaging, and hopefully enlightening discussion this evening. So everything I say that might sound kind of rough, it's not directed at my friend Paul Cooper, it's directed at the position, and it's out of respect for the position that I'm taking it seriously for what it says. Tonight I want to provide four reasons why I believe that Calvinism is problematic. By the end of our discussion tonight, it is merely my hope that we will all have greater clarity on these important doctrinal matters, and I look forward in my first rebuttal to dealing with what Pastor Cooper has said in his opening statements. One, Calvinism is exegetically, biblically exegetically untenable. What about total depravity? What about the idea that man is so totally depraved that he is actually totally unable to respond to God? I don't think this holds up biblically. Proverbs 1, 24 through 29 says, Because I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Why would God laugh at the calamity of suffering people who had no choice on Calvinism? You might wonder whether I'm overstating the Calvinist case. I'm not. Uh, John Calvin himself, in the eternal, uh, concerning the eternal predestination of God, on page 121 of my copy says, If what I teach is true, that those who perish are destined to hell by the eternal good pleasure of God, though the reason does not appear, then they are not found, but made worthy of destruction. Uh, now, Calvinists might not like this, but it is the consistent Calvinism. That is to say, if you adopt Calvinism and you're willing to be consistent, this is what it leads to. But the question I have is, why are all men called if all men are not able to respond? What about unconditional election? Scripture makes it clear that God is willing that all come to repentance. Election is real and it is taught in Scripture. But it is the election of the body of Christ, not the election of particular people, to salvation. Unconditional election of individuals is not consistent with the Bible. Acts 17.30 says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Now since Paul is talking to philosophers here, if he meant that God would call everyone, but only a few even could repent, he could have happily explained that to these trained philosophers. But he didn't, because he meant that God is calling all men to repent, and all men can repent. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, the Calvinists must say that what that means is that God doesn't wish for any of the elect to perish, but of course that's just mere eisegesis from what we've just read. On the basis of this, the Bible does not support the unconditional election of particular people. What about limited atonement? Probably the most controversial of all the points in the tulip. As non-Calvinists, we believe that Christ's death on the cross provided atonement for the sin of the whole world. Every individual can be saved. But it does not guarantee that the benefits of the atonement will be received by every individual. John 1.29 says, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. Romans 5.18, So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, 
Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Now, not all men are justified, but that's only because they don't accept the gift, but it is provided to all men. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. This makes a distinction between all other men, presumably the elect, and believers, showing that all men means all men. Scripture simply does not teach that Jesus only died for a special few, but for the whole world, which does include the elect. What about irresistible grace? Is this taught in Scripture? I don't think so. Listen, the message of Scripture is that God wants all men to come to Him and is disheartened, even angry, when they don't. The drawing of God is persuasive, but not coercive. Luke 7.30 says, But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. Now the word purpose here is the same word used for the counsel of His will in Ephesians 1.11, which says God works all things after the counsel of His will. This passage teaches that these men rejected the will of God. Matthew 23.37 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Scripture provides many examples of people resisting God's will. What about the perseverance of the saints? Well, now, since I personally, and presumably everyone here together, believes in eternal security, I, I see no real reason to take issue with this point, Pastor Cooper. But I would just say that we non-Calvinists do not believe our salvation is eternally secure because God overrides our wills. We simply believe that accepting God's grace is a free choice that has a permanent outcome. So on these grounds, I think the tulip of Calvinism is biblically, exegetically untenable. Two, Calvinism requires a redefinition of established terms and ideas leading to theological contradictions. In order for Calvinism to even get off the ground, one must greatly modify what he means by certain established terms and ideas. The term free and all of its derivatives must be redefined. The idea that God loves everyone must either be retooled or just jettisoned completely. And these two are enough without even speaking of the adjustments made to the terms all or whosoever or world. Let's just look at the first two. The notion of freedom that we use every day is called libertarian freedom. And it means that you have the, the freedom to choose between two or more options. However, Calvinists understand God's foreordination and predetermining of all things to override man's freedom in such a way that what Calvinists mean when they say freedom is that man will do whatever his desires and influences dictate that he will do, but he is never able to make a genuinely free choice to do anything. This is known as compatibilism. It means that man really isn't free. He must do whatever his desires mandate, but his desires were determined for him. In this way, Calvinists can say, sure, man is free to do whatever he wants, but the problem is that since his wants have been chosen for him, his actions therefore have been chosen for him also. Eminent American philosopher and Christian apologist and Southern Baptist, William Lane Craig says about this, quote, determinists reconcile universal divine causal determinism with human freedom by reinterpreting freedom in compatibilist terms. Compatibilism entails determinism. So there's no mystery here. The problem is that adopting compatibilism achieves reconciliation only at the expense of denying what various scriptural texts seem clearly to affirm. Genuine indeterminacy and contingency. John Feinberg, Calvinist philosopher from Trinity Divinity School, says, Calvinists as determinists must either reject freedom altogether or accept compatibilism. So when Calvinists say that man is free, they mean something entirely different than actual freedom. Worse, they're actually affirming determinism. On Calvinism, man is simply not free. And not just not free with respect to their salvation, not free in any sense. But think of what this means. Every time something evil occurs, it occurs ultimately according to the way God wanted things before the world began. The Holocaust of the Jews was according to the will of God. Every time a little child is molested and their innocence stolen, it was according to the will of God. Every aborted child, every case of cancer, every traffic accident, and worst of all, every time an individual is sentenced to an eternity in hell and separation from God, it happened ultimately because that's how God wanted things before the world began, and it literally could not have been otherwise. Therefore, an argument could be framed as follows. One, if Calvinism is true, then sin is the will of God. But two, since it, sin isn't the will of God, therefore three, Calvinism is not true. Secondly, the idea that God loves everyone is simply not true either on Calvinism. 
On Calvinism, God loves the elect. Jesus died and rose again for the few elect. This means that by definition, God, as described by Calvinists, is not omnibenevolent. Of course, a Calvinist can redefine the word love as it relates to God and claim that it is loving for God to allow those he loves to go to hell when they simply could not choose otherwise, and some try to do that. However, if this move is made, then the term love is so far removed from what believers have always thought about God as to require a different word than love altogether. Yet Jesus commands us in Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine 39 to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're to love our enemies. We're to love everyone. But if we do this and compatibilistic Calvinism is true, then our love would be more encompassing than God's love. Do we really want to accept something like that tonight? Now, I hope that Pastor Cooper won't engage in these redefinitions of terms tonight. But when Calvinists do this, they are, in my opinion, engaging in what I call Calvin ball. In the popular comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, the main character invented a game called Calvin Ball. And the only rule was that the rules of the game can change as you continue to play it. This was frustrating for the opponent in Calvin Ball in the comic strip, and it is likewise frustrating for non-Calvinists today when Calvinists redefine terms to such an extent. Three, Calvinism fails to explain God's judgment and actions in Scripture. Since Scripture so frequently gives the impression that man is not only free, but responsible, it seems to support some version of libertarian freedom. Or again, what you and I mean every day when we say we are free to choose between two or more options. If this were not the case, then a number of biblical passages become very awkward. Genesis 6, 5 and 6 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. God is found here disappointed and grieved at man's wickedness. Does that sound to you like a God who planned and ordained these things in the sense that the Calvinist means? Jeremiah 7.31 says, They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind, God says. Now God is omniscient, but these things didn't even come into the mind of God. So this doesn't sound like a God who planned and ordained these things to me. Deuteronomy 30.19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. God is implying that they have a genuine choice here. Not a compatibilistic or soft deterministic choice. A libertarian choice. Why else would he place a curse and a blessing before them to choose from? Jeremiah 36, 3 says, perhaps the, house, perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them, in order that every man will turn from his evil way. Then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. Perhaps, God says. Now, is he just playing games with them? Or does perhaps mean a genuine possibility? In the New Testament, in 1 Timothy 2, 4, it says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Does he really mean that? Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one. 2 Peter 2.1 says that certain people deny the master who bought them. That doesn't sound like limited atonement to me. And in Acts 17.30 it has it all men everywhere. So I ask this simple question. Does it make sense for God to hold people accountable for not choosing to obey Him when it was literally impossible for any of them except the special few elect to do any such thing? If a man is bound by his will to only choose according to his sinful options, then he, is simply, then he simply cannot choose godliness. Worse still, he is punished for choosing A rather than C when in fact only A, B, and D were available to him. Such a proposal seems absurd to me. One might retort that this is precisely the beauty of Calvinism. God breaks into the bondage and draws a man out of the bondage of his will with a grace that is quite literally irresistible. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. But that only sidesteps the conundrum. When your focus is fixed on the future citizen of hell, then the problem comes into view. This person was sentenced to an eternity of separation from God in a place called hell when it was literally impossible for him to choose otherwise. This is why many thinkers reject compatibilism as a satisfactory answer to the nature of reality. Four, Calvinism fails to adequately address atheistic arguments from evil. Now listen closely on this. When atheists who don't believe in God challenge God's existence, they often point to the existence of suffering and evil as an evidence for the non-existence of God. 
If an omnibenevolent God exists, then why is there so much evil in the world? Indeed, depending on whether an atheist brings a logical or an evidential argument from evil, the question may be, why would a loving God uh, uh, allow for any evil at all? And the argument of the old uh, hedonist Epicurus is often thrown at us from the new atheist movement today. But in response to this question, Christian apologists like myself have to respond in one of four ways, generally speaking. They often give the character building answer. And that says that God created a world of suffering and evil because experiencing these things develops our moral character and integrity. And of course that does happen, right? The heaven theodicy says that God created a world of evil, but ultimately the existence of heaven will render this existence merely a veil of tears. And of course that's part of that is true too. And then there's the reformed theodicy. Now listen close because this is what many of our Calvinist brothers within the Southern Baptist Convention hold to, and without the Southern Baptist Convention, that God is actually glorified when individuals suffer or die and go to hell because he is able to exercise his judgment. And then finally, there's the theodicy that I agree with, the free will theodicy, the free will answer. The evil results because God gave man libertarian or soft libertarian freedom, and man chooses to exercise that freedom in rebellion against a holy God. Now, while I find merit in three of these four answers to our atheists, you will notice that the first three I mentioned still place God as the source and author of evil. In other words, God acts in opposition to his own nature and is the direct cause of evil in this world. Only the free will answer, or one of the others combined with the free will answer, results in a situation in which God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Only on the free will theodicy, it is only and directly because of man's sinfulness that the world is filled with suffering and evil. Now you might say, but can't a Calvinist affirm the free will theodicy or answer? Not if he's truly committed to anything we might call Calvinism. The free will theodicy requires some form of what I've said philosophers call libertarian freedom. That is, again, to say what you and I mean every day when we say we are free to choose between two options. Calvinists must, on the other hand, affirm either strict determinism, the idea that no freedom of any kind exists at all, or, more commonly, compatibilism, which is a form of determinism that tries to reconcile free will and determinism by saying, well, you can, follow, you can do whatever you want, but you can't control what you want. God determines your wants, so you really don't have freedom anyway. The cash value of all of this is that without belief in some form of libertarian free will, the free will theodicy is not available. But if the free will theodicy is not available, then believers are left with no adequate answer to atheistic arguments from evil. But if we have no answer to atheistic arguments from evil, and those arguments are successful, they would demonstrate that God does not exist. But of course, we all here tonight know that God does exist, right? And that means that the free will answer is available to us, and Calvinism must be false. To put it very, very simply, if God did not give created beings free will, then God is the source of evil, despite Calvinist claims to the contrary. I'm sure that Pastor Cooper could give me 15 quotes from Calvinist scholars who say they don't believe that God is the source of evil. But I'm saying, as I've said again all night, that if you're consistent with Calvinism, then you can say whatever you want, but consistent Calvinism leads to these kinds of conclusions, and they would lead to contradictions in the very nature of God. It is my contention tonight that based on the four major difficulties with Calvinism I presented, we should conclude that Calvinism is false. In order to demonstrate that Calvinism is true, Pastor Cooper will have to overcome the four arguments I presented and then show that Calvinism is preferable to competing non-Calvinist understandings that Southern Baptists have. Unless and until he does this, Calvinism would seem to be a poor choice for this evening. Man does have the genuine ability to choose. I love my friend Pastor Cooper, and I'm not really confronting him with all of this, but the subject of Calvinism. But God gave you, because of his sovereignty and as an offer of his grace, the ability to make choices. And he is sovereign enough that he can allow you to make choices and still work everything out the way he wants it to be in the end. So tonight I think you should exercise your libertarian freedom to choose to reject Calvinism. Thank you. Ten minutes for a fresh rebuttal. All right. Dr. Hunter holds that Calvinism is problematic, and let me say I agree with that. Calvinism is problematic. In fact, I have a better word for it. It's mysterious. It's hard to grasp how God can be completely and totally sovereign and man have free will. That's hard to grasp. 
It's problematic, potentially. It's mysterious. And so is the Trinity. That God can be three in one. That's problematic. It's mysterious. But it's true. How Jesus could be fully God and fully man, that's problematic. It's mysterious. But it's true. And Calvinism has no problem with saying that God is sovereign and man makes free choices. That man chooses. And I think the Calvinism explanation of how that works is the most appropriate and more importantly, the most biblical answer to that. Now, I have four things that Dr. Hunter shared that I have to respond to so that we know that Calvinism is, is uh, acceptable and I've got nine minutes to do it. It's going to be hard. And a lot of them had a lot of subpoints. to be fair, okay? First off, Dr. Hunter talked about that the doctrines of grace uh, can't be held up to biblical exegesis. Well, in my opening statement, I went all throughout Scripture and showed you that the Bible speaks to the truth of the message of Calvinism. But he broke it down into the five points, and I'll briefly talk about what he says about those five points, okay? He talked about total depravity or total inability. The interesting thing is that the only passage that Dr. Hunter used to say there's, that total depravity is wrong is from Proverbs 1, which is about wisdom. And it's not God laughing and mocking people that he's offered salvation to and saying, ha, 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 you didn't choose salvation and I'm mocking you, even though you can never do it. No, Proverbs 1 is wisdom mocking people for rejecting wisdom. In fact, the Proverbs personifies wisdom as a woman. It's not talking about God the Father mocking people for rejecting him. It's about wisdom rejecting mocking people for rejecting wisdom. That's the only passage he shared on total inability. He talked about unconditional election. And his argument that unconditional election is not biblical was to talk about the fact that there's a general call or a universal call, that God calls all people to be saved. Hey, I agree. God calls all people to be saved. I have no problem with that. We're supposed to take that gospel to all people because we don't know who's going to believe. And I don't see how the fact that a general call exists is a problem for the fact that God has his own people. I don't think there's a difficulty there. Uh, Dr. Hunter also talked about limited atonement. Limited atonement, obviously the most debated, argued aspect of Calvinism. There's lots of people who love to be called four-point Calvinism, Calvinists that have a problem with limited atonement. And people parse it and argue it in so many different ways that I couldn't possibly give you all the different arguments that people have, all the different ideas. All I want to say is that most Calvinists think about the atonement this way. We really believe it. We really believe in penal substitution. We believe in that doctrine that supposedly all evangelicals believe that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, it literally paid the price for people's sin. That sin was paid for and they received his righteousness. And I don't think it's some horrible doctrine to say we believe that. So clearly, only those who believe in Jesus Christ receive the benefits of the atonement. Now, I'm happy to say that the atonement is sufficient for all people as if if all people repented of their sins and all people believed in Jesus Christ, then that atonement would be enough for all people. But it was purposefully meant for those who believe. That's limited atonement. Irresistible grace. Um, Dr. Hunter showed that people reject God's plan for their lives at times. I agree with that too. We, we don't do what God calls us to do all the time. But irresistible grace is talking about something very specific that when God opens up someone's eyes, when they go from darkness to light, that it's so clear and it's so beautiful that they go, yes, I want that. It's not like God comes in and wraps a rope around their will and pulls them dragging and screaming. No, the picture of Calvinism is you've got someone whose will is in bondage. They're enslaved to sin, as the scripture says, Romans chapter 3, no one seeks God, no, not one. You know, nobody is seeking God, but God comes in opens their eyes. They see the beauty of the gospel. What's irresistible about it? It's irresistible like someone who's in a desert and hasn't had a cup of water for a long time and they see water and they say, yes, I want that. We've all, if you're a Christian, you experience that. One day the light came on and you said, praise Jesus, I believe, right? That was God. We wouldn't say that's me. I came up with that. No, God opened up our eyes. It was so beautiful that we were irresistibly drawn to it. We agree on perseverance. The saints, we could 
find ways we could argue about it. I think it'd be a waste of time. I think as Southern Baptists, we can all agree with Article 5 of the Baptist Faith and Message. Won't read it, but we can agree on it. All right, second thing you talked about was that Calvinism means uh, that they would have to redefine terms and that there, there could be theological contradictions. Now, this is a, a heavy philosophical argument that Dr. Hunter offers. You know, the whole argument about libertarian free will and compatibilism. I am not a philosopher. Dr. Hunter is great at that stuff. All I say is the Bible says man makes choices and he's accountable for those choices and God has a sovereign plan. And the Bible preaches both, so I believe both. That God has a plan and we make choices. And we see that uh, all throughout Scripture. Um, you know, you can look at Joseph, right? He's got his brothers. It's their plan. They say, let's throw them into bondage. Let's sell them. You know, he sees his brothers later and he said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. You know, both things existed. You can look at Judas's betrayal of Jesus, right? Judas, what a picture. Judas chooses by his own free will to betray Jesus. At the same time, it's God's sovereign plan. We know it. It says beforehand that, God, that Christ knew Judas was going to do this. And also, even Satan enters the scene on that one. It's really confusing. It's like Job. You see man's free will. You see God's sovereign plan. You see Satan acting. They all are going on at the same time. And somehow, it's problematic. It's a mystery. But it's true. God is sovereign and in control, and we use free will. Now, specifically when it comes to salvation and becoming saved, our wills have to be set free because the Bible says we're in bondage to sin and we don't seek God. So the Holy Spirit has to come and open our eyes and set us free to believe and set our wills free. He also talks about redefining love and said, well, the Calvinists have to say there's different ways in which we use love. Listen, let me be real clear with you. I love Dr. Hunter, okay? I love my wife right here in a totally different way. They don't mean the same thing. They're different. And I can honestly say that God loves all people, but there's a special kind of love he has for his people. Just like Jesus said, uh, well, the scriptures teach us that God, that all of us are God's children and that we're all made in the image of God, right? So in a sense, we're all the children of God. But we all know, because Jesus even said it, that some people are children of Satan and some people are children of God. And it means different things in different ways. Same thing with love. He then went on to talk about how Calvinism fails to explain God's judgment and his actions in Scripture. And he argued about, uh, well, it's interesting that he said that it, Calvinism is beautiful when you talk about saved people, but it's harsh when you talk about people going to hell. And let me be clear. All people, everywhere, deserve help. Amen? Right? We all do. Not one of us can say, well, not me. All of us. So if we're going to say, let's play the fair card, the fair card is we all go to hell. There's nobody in hell that can say, you know what, this isn't fair. I should have got to go to heaven. If you don't think all people deserve to go to hell, your problem is not with Calvinism. It's with the gospel. Because we're all sinners. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Let's be honest. The argument that he makes here is that, hey, this isn't fair because God sends people to hell who didn't have a chance to believe. This is not a Calvinism problem. This is a problem for every evangelical that believes that one must hear the gospel to be saved. I have a heart for missions. I've gone to Aceh, Indonesia three times. The Achenese are a Muslim people. They, they, they have not given their life to Christ for the most, vast majority of them. A tsunami hit there years ago. 60, 80, over 100,000 of them died who never heard the gospel. And you say, well, do they go to hell? Listen, if you believe Romans 10, if you're not a universalist and you believe that someone has to hear the gospel to be saved, we have to say, sadly, they went to hell. And we all have to answer that question, not just Calvinism. And then he talks about atheist arguments uh, for evil. Listen, this is where we can agree. We all had libertarian free will when you go back to Adam and Eve. Why is evil in the world? Because Adam and Eve had free will, and they chose to sin. And the book of Romans says sin entered the world, tainted the world, and now sin exists because of man's free will through Adam and Eve. I got them all. <laughs> Dr. Hunter, a 10-minute rebuttal to Pastor Paul's opening statement. 
You only have two points that I make. So. <laughs> Should be easy. Well, if you haven't noticed, because of the nature of debate, I now have to respond to what he said in his uh, opening response, and I'll get to those things that he just now said in my second rebuttal, so look forward to that, those of you that haven't left. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Cooper, for that heartfelt opening statement and first response. I find it somewhat interesting that, though I sympathize with him with a lot of what he says in his opening statement, 75% of it does not require an answer from me. Why? Because it wasn't really the subject of tonight's debate. I agree that Calvinists can be evangelistic. I agree that there are unevangelistic Arminians, which is certainly no problem for me since I don't identify with either one of those terms, as most Southern Baptists don't, but I consider myself a traditionalist, to use the most recent language. I don't have any problem. I'm not here to kick anybody out of the Southern Baptist Convention either, uh, Pastor Cooper, so you can rest uh, easy on that one. Um, and I agree with Adrian Rogers that God is sovereign and that he elects and predestines believers. I agree that if you don't accept that, you're not being biblical. But see, it's very important that you identify what you mean by those terms because we have very different meanings for them. In case anybody doesn't know, Adrian Rogers was certainly no Calvinist. And I would argue that he's definitely now not a Calvinist. But um, I, I would say this. Sovereignty doesn't need a new meaning that Calvinists often give to it. Pastor Cooper keeps saying all night tonight, well, look, you, you can have free will and have sovereignty at the same time. As if I disagree with the idea of sovereignty. Listen to me, friends. I agree that God is sovereign. Sovereignty means, that we have a term, we have an understanding of what that means. A sovereign is someone who has ultimate authority, who can step in at any time, who can do what he pleases. Those are all things that we know God is and God can do. What it does not mean is divine determinism in a philosophical sense, which is what Calvinists do with that term. And then ask you, well, you believe in sovereignty, don't you? Well, sure I do. Oh, well, then you're a Calvinist like me. But we understand those terms very, very differently. Do we believe in election? Sure we do. When election is mentioned with salvation in view, it is always corporate in nature. And I'll more on that in just a minute. Whenever it's with respect to individuals, it has to do with service. So, for example, case in point, Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, we see corporate election. A group of people, a people for himself, the body of Christ, namely. How do we know that it's a group of people and not an individual? Because Paul says 23 times in Ephesians chapter 1, we, us, you, and things like that, referring to a plurality of people. And he says 10 times in Christ, in the beloved, in Jesus, all referring to Jesus. We, as a group of people, the people of God, were chosen in Jesus. And I think we all, um, uh, many of us are on the same page with that tonight. And do we believe in predestination? Sure. In Romans chapter 8, what's predestined is that if you become a part of the corporate body of Christ, you will become like the Son. And in Ephesians chapter 1, what's predestined is that if you become a part of the body of Christ, you'll receive the inheritance of Christ. So it's important how you define those terms. That's very, very important. And then finally, in the last 25% of what Pastor Cooper said in his opening statement, I found something with which to disagree directly. That's how much we get along. But I finally found some things to disagree with. He says Calvinism is beautiful and poetic. Well, and he says that my former debating partner in Miami, Joe Myra, says that it's ugly and harsh. I'm not exactly sure that's exactly what Pastor Cooper said in that way. I think it was said it was discomforting or something. But, but, but let's think about that for a moment. I agree that on, and if you focus your attention on the future citizen of heaven, it's beautiful. It's poetic. This man was drawn out of the bondage of his will and into a grace that was irresistible. I mean, that's beautiful. But that only sidesteps the conundrum, like I said in my opening statement. When you think about the future citizen of hell, here you see a person. Do all people deserve to go to hell? Absolutely. But why do all people deserve to go to hell? All people deserve to go to hell because we're wicked, sinful people who chose to rebel against God. But if Calvinism is true, we are people that God chose to do all of those things, if you're a consistent Calvinist. And so, um, so, so this is a very important point. We need to remember that on, if you look at that person, here's a man who suffers in hell for all eternity when it literally could not have been otherwise. Now, that may be poetic in an Edgar Allan Poe sort of way, but it's not beautiful, at least not from my perspective. Um, well, then he talks about the book of life. He says, it might surprise some of you to know that your, these names were written down before the world began. I would suspect most of you all would have issues with that. I actually don't have an issue with that, Pastor Cooper. I believe that. I believe when you choose to reject God for the final time, your name is removed from the book of life. And that's why when children die, they go to heaven, or at least one of the reasons. So I don't have a problem with that sort of thing. The point is, Southern Baptists understand, who are non-Calvinists understand those things differently. 
He then gave us some texts for uh, individual election. Jeremiah 1.5, uh, Psalm 139.16, Luke 1, Galatians 1.15. Remember what I said about election and whether it's individual or group? These are individuals, and so this is an election to service in each case. The closest you come to an election to salvation is in Galatians 1.15 with, with Paul. But there, if you look at the story in context, you see that God influenced Paul, but not to the point of coercion, which is what traditionalists like myself already believe. So there's no Calvinism in these texts. What about Deuteronomy 7, 1 Peter 2, John 15, John 10, and there was another one I think that I missed. Listen, those are examples of corporate election. Like I said, God, whenever salvation is in view, it's corporate in nature, and you can check those out and see that. There's no Calvinism in those passages. What about, um, what about John chapter 6? He quoted several verses from there. This is important because this is a favorite Calvinist proof text, and I really don't understand why. Because if you get the context right, I don't see it there. In John chapter 6, what you have is a specific group of people who were handed over from the Father to Jesus. They were the God-fearing Jews during the first century who were already worshiping the one true God. And so when Jesus came as the embodiment of the one true God, they began to worship Him. He, Jesus told them in the previous chapter, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me. And so He raises all of them up and loses none of them. There's those who heard and learned from the Father, past tense, come to me, present tense. Showing that this was a specific people at a specific time. So there's no Calvinism in John chapter 6 if you do the exegesis. What about Acts chapter 13 verse 48? Those who were appointed or ordained to eternal life believed. Now the word appointed or ordained here is translated elsewhere in Scripture as devoted or disposed. For example, 1 Corinthians 16, 15 has it devoted. So as many as devoted themselves to eternal life believed. No non-Calvinist sees an issue with that. There's no Calvinism in that passage. Now, what if we did understand those things the way that Pastor Cooper understands them? I don't, I don't think they're correct, so that's why I reject them. If, if I thought the Bible taught those things, I'd be a Calvinist today. But, but why, what, what's, uh, what happens if you accept those? Well, it leads to contradictions, and that was part of the issue with my opening statement that he didn't want to deal with. But, but I want to say with all due respect, and I, again, I appreciate Pastor Cooper. I love him. He's my brother. Um, we even like the same music, and that's important. I keep debating people that have the same taste in music. That goes a long way. But I want you to know that when I was 15 years old, I first encountered a Calvinist in the church I was attending, a college student, and he explained Calvinism to me. And after he explained Calvinism to me, I thought about it logically and, and tried to consistently get to what it would lead to. Now, I didn't know all the terminology that, that we all know today, but this is what I came to determine. If Calvinism is true, God is the source and author of evil. God doesn't love everyone. God doesn't want everybody to be saved. Jesus didn't die for everyone. Double predestination is true. And the free freedom to choose between two options does not actually exist. But whenever I presented that to a Calvinist, they said what Pastor Cooper has said tonight. Well, that's just a straw man. You don't understand Calvinism. You're defining Calvinism wrongly. And I would say there are many non-Calvinists here tonight who have talked to Calvinists who have said that to them. But after 18 years of studying this, I've come to determine that I was right as a 15-year-old boy. If you are consistent with your Calvinism and follow it to where it leads, and remember, are consistent with it, then you come to a situation where God doesn't love everybody, God's the source of evil, God doesn't want everyone to be saved, Jesus didn't die for everyone, double predestination is true, and the freedom to actually choose between two options does not exist. Now, I want you to understand something, friends. I don't think Pastor Cooper believes that. Because what he said tonight, and I actually have a quote here from him. He preached a message several years ago called His Glorious Church, What Is It? In which he says, maybe, in which he says, God's sovereignty never negates our free will. You must have faith. God doesn't make you have faith. He said, maybe there are people who think there's a stamp on my head. Some people don't have the stamp on their head. And so that's all that matters. And God will make people believe that don't believe. It's not like that, he says, end quote. Well, then what he's describing stops short of consistent compatibilism that leads to those things. Instead, he's affirming libertarian free will on the one hand and strict determinism on the other hand. But folks, that is a flat contradiction. Now, I'm, I, now I say that out of respect for Pastor Cooper because I'd rather him be, a, be contradicting himself than to be saying that God doesn't love everybody, Jesus didn't die for everybody, God didn't want everybody to be saved, and I don't think that he would ever say any of those things. So I think what he would say about that, I don't want to speak for him, but what other Calvinists would say is, well, that's hyper-Calvinism. I don't know what hyper-Calvinism is anymore. Because I, when I look at it, that's consistent Calvinism. If you embrace Calvinism and follow it to its conclusion, that's what you get. So maybe a hyper-Calvinist is a Calvinist on Red Bull. I don't know. But I've given you four reasons tonight to think that Calvinism needs to be rejected. And I don't think we've seen any good reason in the end to embrace Calvinism. So I'd ask you to exercise your freedom to choose to reject it. Thank you.
five minute second rebuttal. All right, I'm so thankful that Dr. Hunter agreed with 75% of what I said. I did not agree with that much of what he said, so I win. <laughs> just, just kidding, I'm just kidding. He's being gracious. Um, okay, let me hit a couple of things. Um, First off, a big part of a response against Calvinism is to talk about election because it's in the Bible. These words are in the Bible, so you've got to say, what do they mean? Um, and what you'll often hear is that election is corporate. Um, first off, let me say that the problem with that argument is almost all of the New Testament is written to a corporate audience. So you could, you could take anything and go, well, that's not really meant for me. That's meant for the church because the New Testament's just written that way. So just because the New Testament says something is meant corporatively for the church doesn't mean it's not also true for individuals. In fact, it is. Now, I'm not sure how popular Mitt Romney is, but I'm going to quote him. Corporations are people. Cor corporate bodies are made up of individual people. And what's true of the corporate body is true of the individual. The church is called to be holy. So am I. The church is called to sacrifice, to give, to love, to share Christ. So am I and so are you. So I, I don't see how the corporate argument all of a sudden means, well, that it can't be for individuals, because I think it's both. Also, uh, Dr. Hunter made the argument that election in the Bible is always talked about in the context of service. Okay, I totally agree with that, completely. Because you could read those passages and it always talks about it, but he's missed a step, okay? So he says, election is for service. Well, he missed a step. All those passages say election is for salvation for the purpose of service. It's both. You can look at Ephesians 1. That's the argument it's making. We've been elected because we've been elected to be God's saved people, but he didn't save us so we can walk around and say, well, we're the frozen chosen, and we don't have to worry about anything else. No, he's elected us to make us a people who do what he's called us to do, to show Christ. Right, First Peter, I quoted earlier, we are a chosen people. Why? To make him known, to be lights in the darkness. So yeah, it's for service, but it's, we're elected to be saved for service. Also, um, I do want to say this, and this really doesn't go into what we've been talking about. Practically, this is a strong belief of mine. Practically, these differences don't matter. Whether you're a Calvinist or Arminian, you believe, as long as you're, when I say a Calvinist, I say a biblical believing, evangelical Calvinist, you believe, or an Arminian, or a traditionalist, or whatever, if you're an evangelical, you believe that people are lost, that they're going to hell, they need Jesus, and we need to share Christ with them. We can all agree on that. We all know, we all agree with this. Some people will believe and some people won't. We can all agree with that. And so practically much of this doesn't matter. <clears throat> the difference is I can share Christ knowing great. So some people are going to believe because he has his people. But he knows that some people will believe too. So practically I don't see a lot of uh, disagreement here. And then I also want to talk about, uh, and I kind of got on this with my last point. I'm sure he's going to respond to that with his second, is the... Um, philosophical consistency argument. And that's Dr. Hunter continues to hit that a consistent Calvinist must believe this and must believe this and must believe this. And he says we must believe a lot of things, some of which I don't believe. A lot of those things I don't believe. And here's my comfort, and maybe it's, a, it's an ignorant comfort because I'm not a philosopher. I just believe if the Bible says two things are true, then both are true. So philosophical consistency Sometimes it's hard when it's biblical mystery. And I'm comfortable with mystery. And I'm comfortable saying, I can't explain all of it. I just know God has a people that he's chosen and he loves and he cares for and he calls them and he opens their eyes like all those passages say that I shared. And yet we have to believe and we're responsible for our choices. And even though we're in bondage to sin before we come to Christ. We're responsible for our choices because the Bible says that. It says before Jesus, we're dead in our trespasses. We're in bondage to sin. We are made ourselves an enemy to God, but yet we're accountable for every, every choice we make. But God sets us free.
And I praise God for that. Dr. Hunter, your second rebuttal, five minutes. All right, thank you very much. Well, now I have a lot to respond to myself. Um, he says that, uh, that he asked, well, he says, well, he's referring to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 39 and following. He says, that's just talking about wisdom. Well, okay, it's talking about wisdom. And if you don't have the proper wisdom, it's going to lead to a dread that comes like a whirlwind and all these sorts of awful things, and God's mocking that person. So my question is now, why is God mocking someone who rejects wisdom when it was literally impossible for them to embrace the wisdom? Because God didn't decree that they would embrace the wisdom. I, I still have a problem with that, so I think the point stands. What about the general and effectual call? If you don't understand what Calvinists mean when they talk about the general and effectual call, here's what it means. The general call goes out to everyone, and everybody hears it. The effectual call is the one that actually gets people saved. And that only goes out to the elect, and they cannot resist it. So the first call of God, the general call, absolutely does nothing. I don't understand the point of the general call on the Calvinist system. Uh, I understand the point of the effectual call, but, of course, that, that doesn't handle the problem. So I, I don't know about that. He said some other things about the tulip of Calvinism I'm not going to have time to get to. Um, I, I wish that I could. Well, he did talk about um, Romans chapter 3, and he said, No one seeks after God. Well, I, you know, I'm surprised that he brings that up because I, this did get covered in my debate with Joe Myra in Miami last year. But um, in Romans chapter 3, Paul is referencing when he says no one seeks after God, no one is righteous, no, not one. He's referencing Psalm uh, chapter 14. And in Psalm 14, uh, David says this, no one is righteous, no one seeks after God, no, not one. And he's clearly speaking poetically. This is a, this is, I mean, after all, David's seeking after God, right? This is a situation where you've got to get the genre right. And guess what? If you took that so woodenly, as Pastor Cooper has done tonight, to say that it literally means no one, then guess what you end up with? The very next pass part of that passage in Psalm 14 says that the wicked people of the world want to devour people, the God, people of God like bread. So in other words, if you take it that way, then every person that's unelect and lost desperately wants to be a cannibal. Now, I don't think anybody wants to accept that tonight. So I don't think that passage means what he thinks it means. All right. Um, he says, well, I'm not a philosopher, so I, I don't know how to I, I don't know what he's doing with this stuff about the free will. Well, I'm just saying you can either be contradictory and say that libertarian freedom exists on the one hand and divine determinism exists on the other. You either have a contradiction or you can say God doesn't love everybody. God doesn't want everybody to be saved and be consistent. So, I mean, you have to pick there. And that is a tough spot for Calvinists. That's one of the reasons I'm not a Calvinist. Um, he says all people deserve hell. He said a while ago, and I, I think I handled that in my last uh, point and he says we all have this problem we all have this problem of uh, the, the unevangelized and God's judgment and actions in scripture well not me because I don't know how God's going to judge the, the unevangelized I, I think it's very, very interesting that in Muslim countries right now Jesus is just appearing out of nowhere and witnessing to Muslims and they're getting saved and going to churches and testifying about that I think it's interesting that whenever a missionary shows up in a country where uh, when, it, when we hadn't been there yet often we find out they were praying for God to reveal himself to them I don't know how God's going to handle all that. As a Molinist, I have an answer to that that's different, and I don't know if it's true or not. But there are all kinds of options for non-Calvinists. On Calvinism, God didn't want those people to be saved. That's the only option. And I find that to be a terrible option. So, um, uh, so, uh, so he says, Adam and Eve, they had libertarian freedom. Well, here's my problem. I keep hearing from Calvinists, I haven't heard Pastor Cooper say this, so maybe he doesn't feel this way, but I keep hearing Calvinists say that God couldn't give man free will because if he did, he would be less sovereign because he's not completely in control. So why, if he can give Adam and Eve libertarian freedom, why does that not take away from his sovereignty? That doesn't seem consistent to me. He talks about Joseph and Judas and things like that. Listen, those really speak more to God's omniscience than they do divine determinism. Listen, God knew in his foreknowledge that those people were going to do a wicked thing and he decided to bring something beautiful out of it. That's the God we serve. And I thank God for that because every time somebody gets married out of, or gets pregnant out of wedlock, I don't think God liked the sin, but I think he can do something wonderful with that child, don't you? And so that's an important point. He said corporate groups are made up of individuals. Well, I don't know exactly what Mitt Romney thinks about that, but I'll tell you this much. Yes, corporate groups are made up of individuals. And yes, God knows who's going to be in that corporate group, but that's because of his foreknowledge. But let me tell you why that doesn't matter. If the radio station decided they were going to give all of the members of Northwestern Baptist Church t-shirts, 
Um, they could do that for the corporate body, and whether or not, and if you're not a member of the church, you can decide to get that T-shirt by joining the church as an individual. But for them to decide to give it to the corporate group is a different thing. So that handles that, I think. And he says this practically makes no difference. Listen to me, friends. I believe Paul Cooper is saved, and I'm willing to be evangelized alongside of him. But truth matters. Now it's time for a five-minute closing, and Brother uh, Braxton will begin with him since you had the first opening. In case you're wondering what that's about, Paul Cooper is in the privileged position. He's making the affirmative case. That's how this works, and so he gets to make the first and closing statement. So um, I won't get to respond to what he says, so brother, have at it after this. Um, but, um, but listen, I, I want to say some things to sort of draw some threads together from what we've been talking about this evening. You know, tonight we've talked about a lot of different things. I want to again thank Pastor Cooper for his willingness to take part in this debate tonight. And Paul, let me tell you something. I love you, brother. I hope you still love me after this. And it's been really hard saying some of these things with your sweet wife sitting down there, who I love even more than I love you. So, um, <laughs> does God have different senses in his love? Absolutely. But here's the problem. Yeah, I love other kids differently than I love my own kids. Nevertheless, as he said, uh, that is a little bit different situation with God. And what Calvinists do, I think, is not give love a different sense, but to take the term love, turn it on its head, empty it of all its meaning, and say, God loves you unelect in the sense that he's going to be nice to you for a little while while you're on earth and, and maybe you know, rain and your crops will grow, but then you're going to die and go to hell for all eternity and be tortured in horrible pain. Now, I don't call that love on any definition of love. That's why I say that. Tonight I've given four general reasons why I think we should reject Calvinism. You'll recall I argued that Calvinism is biblically, exegetically untenable. Now we've heard some interesting things about that, and I've responded to some of what he said. I wasn't able to get to all of it, but I really think that point still stands, and um, I think we've seen that tonight, and I'd love to have had more time to respond to more of what Paul Cooper says on that. Secondly, I argued that Calvinism requires a redefinition of established terms and ideas that lead to theological and philosophical contradictions. And we've just talked about that with love. We've talked about it with freedom. In fact, with freedom, he says, look, it's a mystery. Well, listen, I want you to understand something, folks. A mystery in the Bible is something that's not a contradiction. We just don't have all the answers. So the Trinity is a mystery to me. Listen, the Trinity is not a contradiction. The Trinity says one God, three persons. If it said one God and three gods, that'd be an explicit contradiction. If it said one person and three persons, that'd be a contradiction. It doesn't say that. It says one God, three persons. That's a mystery. I don't know how that works, but it's not a contradiction. All right? This is a contradiction. To say that we have libertarian freedom on the one hand and say that divine determinism is true on the other, it's a contradiction and it simply cannot be true. It's, a contradiction is like saying, uh, uh, saying that someone's a married bachelor. Well, that doesn't even make sense. It can't possibly be true because one negates the other. So I think that point still stands. Three, I demonstrate that Calvinism fails to adequately explain God's judgment and actions in Scripture. The story of the Bible is man sins and God says you've got two options here. If you do the right thing, I'll bless you. If you don't do the right thing, I'll curse you. You make the choice. Again and again and again, that's the story of the Bible. On Calvinism, that is all a farce. Because you really don't have genuine freedom to choose. And again, Pastor Cooper keeps trying to hold on to libertarian freedom. And uh, I know why. Because if he embraces compatibilism, it means God doesn't love everybody, Jesus didn't die, for, and all those things that I mentioned. Four, I argued that Calvinism leaves us with no reasonable answer to arguments from evil. In other words, if Calvinism is true and God decreed all things, everything, good, bad, or indifferent, no man has free will, then it means that God is the source of evil in this world. And I don't think we've really heard any response to that tonight, maybe because of time. Now listen to me, friends. I, I, I go to a church in Evansville, Indiana that's in the inner city, and there's a girl that came forward after a service one day and said to the pastor, do you believe what you just said? And he said, absolutely. She said, do you believe that God loves me? Yes. Do you believe Jesus died for me? Yes, Jesus died for you. She said, well, I can't save myself. And despite what my Calvinist friends think, I don't think she can either. But you know what? He led her to the Lord Jesus Christ. She was saved. I believe she's in heaven tonight because five weeks later she was telling her boyfriend about it and he beat her so brutally that she died. I believe she's in heaven today. But can I say those things from a consistent Calvinist perspective? I don't think that I could. But Paul Cooper will say those things. Will say that God loves her and Jesus died. But a consistent Calvinist can't say that. Why? Arthur Pink says God does not love everybody in his book, The Sovereignty of God. No, God doesn't love you, sweetheart. I'm sorry. Or he may or he may not. I don't know who the elect are. Does Jesus, did Jesus die for me? I could say absolutely yes. 
Could I say that from a consistent Calvinist perspective? I don't think I could. Jay Adams, the author of the book, Competent Counsel, says, says, you should never tell an unsaved counselee that Christ died for them. Only he knows the elect for whom he died. Now, folks, does that sound like the God that Southern Baptists believe in? And I'm not saying we should kick, Southern, kick Calvinists out of the convention because, again, Pastor Cooper doesn't believe that. But I'm going to tell you what. That is the consistent Calvinism. And that doesn't sound like the God I worship. Not to me. Tonight I've given you four reasons to reject Calvinism. I don't get a chance to respond to what Pastor Cooper says. So check out trinitysim.edu and braxcenter.com for more on this. But I haven't heard any good reason tonight to embrace Calvinism. I love you, Pastor Cooper. Thank you so much. I love you too. Um, first off, I just want to say the, the, the whole debate, and you could probably pick this up through the night, is that we can context each other to death. I can give a whole bunch of passages that say clearly show Calvinism, and Dr. Herring go, well, that's not the right context, that's not the right context, not the right context, and then vice versa. And we've done some of that. So part of the problem is uh, we're just going to take passages differently um, and sometimes just have to agree to disagree. I will mention one, though. He, he, he argued that Romans 3 can't be taken the way I said it because it's poetic right after arguing for Proverbs 1, which is poetic as well, by the way. Um, so you, you used a poetic passage. Um, he also talked about uh, it's not consistent to say that man has free will and God is sovereign the way that Calvinists mean it. And I've got to say, I haven't heard him explain Joseph and his brothers when both things are said to be true. I haven't heard him explain Judas and others when the book of Acts specifically tell us that this was God's foreordained plan, that these men would do these things to Jesus, yet they used their own free will to do it. You could take another example, like the writings of Scripture, right? Now, if we believe in complete free will libertarianism, that the authors of the New Testament were just completely using their free will and it wasn't under the sovereign guidance of God, then man, we sure are lucky that every word of the New Testament was exactly what God wanted, even though they were using their complete free will to write it. But we don't. We say these men somehow mysteriously used their free will to write these books of the Bible, and yet God sovereignly made sure it was exactly what you and I needed every single day of our lives as we grow in knowing who Christ is. So you could say I'm inconsistent, but you'd have to say Scripture's inconsistent. But it's not. It's not a contradiction. It's a mystery. I also want to say this. Part of why people get frustrated with Calvinism is they look at it as in a foresight sense and not a hindsight sense. Calvinism should never be used as foresight. And, and he mentioned a sermon, which I think is really cool, that he got on the internet and listened to my sermons to get a quote. That's awesome. And I, I've listened to him as well on, on the internet. Um, Calvinism cannot be used to say, well, I know this person's saved and this person's not saved and I'm not going to pray for them and I'm, not, and I'm going to pray for them. It's not meant for that purpose. You will destroy your brain if you think of Calvinism as I'm trying to figure out who's saved or who's not. I have a friend who has a little baby and she says it stresses her out wondering if her child is of the elect. Yep. If that's your Calvinism, then throw it away. That baby needs the gospel. That baby needs parents that bring that baby in the, up in the Lord and a biblical example and to share Christ and hope that person will come to know Christ. So it's not about foresight. It's about hindsight. The beauty of Calvinism is for us as believers. This isn't part of, uh, you don't proclaim Calvinism to proclaim the gospel. It's for us as believers to go look at the beauty of the gospel of what God has done for us. That yes, he died for me, but he also knew me before the foundations of the world. He called me to himself. He chose me not based on what I've done, but simply for his own glory and based on his own sovereign plan. And we can praise God for that. And of course, it should compel us to worship. God's love compels us. So the purpose of Calvinism is to magnify the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ for the believer to compel us to serve Christ and share Christ. And let me be clear, if your study of Calvinism, as it didn't do for a 15-year-old Dr. Hunter, if your study of Calvinism does not make you want to love Christ more and share Christ more and magnify God more, then fine, leave it. 
I'd rather you love Jesus and share Christ than be a Calvinist. Even though I think Calvinism's right, because it doesn't, it's a peripheral issue, and the purpose of it is for us to glorify God and to be compelled by his love to live for him. And if it doesn't do that, I told this to a seminary student once who was coming to Southern, who was passionate about Calvinism. And I want to learn more. Give me books on Calvinism. I said, brother, if Calvinism doesn't make you want to love people more and share Christ more, then I don't want you studying Calvinism. I want you to love God and love people. Those are the greatest commandments. So I think that's more important than anything. We love God and we love people. And we're going to agree to disagree.